Well, good morning, everyone. We have come on Sunday mornings to the end of our study on the book of Joshua. We've called this series, as you can see on the screen, Promises, and it's been an intriguing study. I find that um, when I read Joshua, the book begins on a very high note, and it's one of those, well, few books in the Bible that I guess ends on a very high note as well. You, um, you come into this book with great expectations and anticipation. And you're really not let down as you work through the book. Then you come to the end of the book, and it just, it, chapter 24 feels like an exclamation point on the whole thing. It, it, all, it, it all comes together, and it actually doesn't unravel until you turn the next page and get into the book of Judges, but we're not going to do that. So uh, we'll end this on a, on a high note. I'd like to read you Genesis, or Genesis. What, what book are we doing? Joshua. Joshua 24. <clears throat> it's been one of those weeks, so um, I'm, I'm hoping I can remember everything I want to say to you. Joshua 24. Um, let me read down to verse, about verse 28. It's a great talk that Joshua gives to the whole nation when he's probably over 100 years old because he dies at 110. And um, this is what he says says in verse 1, Joshua assembled all the tribes of Israel at Shechem. He summoned the elders, leaders, judges, and officials of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. Joshua said to all the people, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, long ago your ancestors, including Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates River, and they worshipped other gods. But I took your father Abraham from the land beyond the Euphrates and led him throughout Canaan and gave him many descendants. I gave him Isaac, and to Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. I assigned the hill country of Seir to Esau, but Jacob and his family went down to Egypt. Then I sent Moses and Aaron, and I afflicted the Egyptians by what I did there, and I brought you out. When I brought your people out of Egypt, you came to the sea, and the Egyptians pursued them with chariots and horsemen as far as the Red Sea, but they cried to the Lord for help, and he put darkness between you and the Egyptians. He brought the sea over them and covered them. You saw with your own eyes what I did to the Egyptians. Then you lived in the wilderness for a long time. I brought you to the land of the Amorites who lived east of the Jordan. They fought against you, but I gave them into your hands. I destroyed them from before you. And you took possession of their land. When Balak, son of Zippor, the king of Moab, prepared to fight against Israel, he sent for Balaam, son of Beor, to put a curse on you. But I wouldn't let, listen to Balaam, so he blessed you again and again, and I delivered you out of his hand. Then you crossed the Jordan and came to Jericho. The citizens of Jericho fought against you, as did also the Amorites and a bunch of other people. But I gave them into your hands. Well, you try and read it up here. I mean, really. <clears throat> I sent the hornet ahead of you, which drove them out before you, also the two Amorite kings. You didn't do it with your own sword and bow. So I gave you a land in which you did not toil and cities you did not build, and you live in them and eat from vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. Now, fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worship beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, or maybe you could say unreasonable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us to forsake the Lord to serve other gods. It was the Lord our God himself who brought us and our parents up out of Egypt from that land of slavery and performed those great signs before our eyes. He protected us on our entire journey and among all the nations through which we traveled. And the Lord drove out before us all the nations, including the Amorites who lived in the land. We too will serve the Lord because he is our God. Surprisingly, that's my word, but surprisingly, Joshua said to the people, you're not able to serve the Lord. He's a holy God. He's a jealous God. 
He will not forgive your rebellion and your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, he'll turn and bring disaster on you and make an end of you after he's been good to you. But the people said to Joshua, No, we will serve the Lord. Then Joshua said, You are witnesses against yourselves that you've chosen to serve the Lord. Yes, we're witnesses, they replied. Now then, said Joshua, Throw away the foreign gods that are among you, and yield your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, We will serve the Lord our God and obey him. On that day, Joshua made a covenant for the people, and right there at Shechem, he reaffirmed for them decrees and laws. And Joshua recorded these things in the book of the law of God. Then he took a large stone and set it up there under the oak near the holy place of the Lord. See, he said to all the people, this stone will be a witness against us. It's heard all the words the Lord has said to us. It'll be a witness against you if you're untrue to your God. Then Joshua dismissed the people, each to their own inheritance. The book of Joshua, if you read it, if you were to read it through maybe at one sitting, you might pick this up, but it's kind of bracketed or framed by God's speech, by God speaking. It begins with God's speech to Joshua in Joshua chapter 1, and it's a speech that is centered on God's promises. Now when you come to the end of the book, um, chapter 24, it again ends with God speaking, not to Joshua this time only, but to all the people. And he's reciting all that he's done, all that God has done for Israel. God has done much. The promises are fulfilled. And so the book's just bracketed by God speaking, kind of around the promises that he gave these people. Here's the promises I've given you. Go and get them. That's really chapter 1. Now you come to chapter 24, and he says, and all the promises that God gave you have actually been fulfilled. One of the most famous verses in the Bible, certainly in Joshua, is in this chapter. That's, that's verse 15. The, the last line. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. If, if you go into a lot of Christian homes, you will find this verse more than any other verse on the wall. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Um, but what most people haven't really dug into is what comes before that verse and what comes after. It's got a context, a setting that's very, very important that I want you to look at today. And I think what's important to realize when you hear that verse, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord, it really isn't evangelistic. I've heard it used that way. I've heard evangelists and pastors and preachers say, now choose Jesus or, or your own deal. And, and that, you can use it that way for sure. But the real heartbeat of this verse, of this chapter, is not so much evangelism, but discipleship. That's what it's about. Um, it's about lifelong discipleship, this chapter. Or, as we've said before, a long obedience in the same direction. That's what this chapter is about. It, um, it says this, really that a life of faithful discipleship is sustained by wise, God-informed choices. Have you ever said to yourself, I know that God has forgiven my sins because I've confessed them and I've trusted Christ. But my issue is, how do I keep going that way for the rest of my life and not fall back? This chapter and this verse will tell you that a life of faithful discipleship is sustained by wise, God-informed choices. That's the key to discipleship. Um, and that's what this chapter is all about. So I think as we look at it and read it, we'll recognize that the way to make progress in the Christian life is to choose wisely, and then to choose again wisely, and to keep choosing wisely. And as you see in this chapter, um, your choices and my choices, they actually have eternal consequences. So it's very important that we make wise choices. The chapter is divided neatly into two parts. 
um, verses 1 to 13 are one part, and verses 14 to 28 are the second part. The last bit of the chapter is just an addendum. talks about the death and burial of, of uh, Joshua and um, Israel moving on from that point. But the chapter really is in two parts. And it's interesting because in one sense, you're almost supposed to start with part two. Um, because part two is about this. Choose who you will serve. That's verses 14 to 28. Choose who you'll serve. But part one kind of leads you up to that point. Part one is about um, why the Lord is the best choice. So verses 1 to 13, what, what God through Joshua is saying is, I want to tell you why I'm the best, the wisest choice that anybody could make for their God. And then the last part of the chapter says, so choose whom you're going to serve. So I just, I want to look at it that way with you because it's a great chapter that way. If you're going to make wise choices, if we're going to say, but as for me and my household, we're going to serve the Lord, then you have to first of all look back at your history. You have to see your story. It's not just a, it's not just the decision of a moment. It's not just something that's done when our emotions run high or when we see the verse on the wall or when we hear some preacher talking about it. That decision comes out of a good, hard, long look at my history, at my story. And that's what Joshua does with these people. Um, and that's verses 1 to 13, why the Lord is the best choice. The emphasis on those verses is on what God has done for them. And the fact is highlighted over and over again that he actually did it. In other words, he looks at these people gathered before him, and God through Joshua says, you are not self-made people. The only reason that you're here today is I've done some things for you. And, and he highlights it in these verses, that they're there because he's done it for them. In fact, just if you had a highlighter in these 13 verses, it would be intriguing to highlight every time God, said, God says something like this, I took, I gave, I sent, I brought you out, I brought you in, I destroyed your enemies. Everything is about what God has done. I took, I gave, I sent, I brought you out, I brought you in, I destroyed all of your enemies. It, they may have been tempted at this point in their history to think, look at what we've done. I mean, we are here in this land. We have amazing homes and vineyards. Our enemies are at bay. And um, we've conquered this place. Look at what we've done. But Joshua won't let them get away with that. They were to remember that what they, they were to remember what they had been and where God had found them and the fact that they would still be there if God hadn't sovereignly chosen them to be his people. And in these 13 verses, at least two things are highlighted. One, God's amazing grace. Uh, just look at verse 2. Joshua said to all the people, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, long ago your ancestors, and he remembers Abraham and Nahor, they lived way over on the other side of the Euphrates River, and they worshipped other gods, but I took your father Abraham from the land beyond the Euphrates. And in a very real sense, I brought him to myself. Isn't that amazing? That's amazing grace. You know what he's saying? He's saying Abraham was an idol worshiper, just like all of his neighbors and friends. He didn't have a right thought about the living God. He didn't know anything about the living God. God chose him out of that lifestyle. Why? Not because he was better than all the rest. Some people think that God chose Abraham because there was some good that God saw in Abraham. No, there wasn't. Some people think that God chose Abraham because, well, well maybe, maybe he saw something that would actually lead to faith. No, he didn't. He really saw nothing in Abraham because Abraham was an idol worshiper. He had his eyes in the wrong place. He, would, he didn't even know there was a, a living God. But God's amazing grace came, and he put his hand on Abraham, and he called Abraham, the idol worshiper, out of his country, and he made an incredible great nation out of him and gave him those amazing promises. And what 
God's doing here in verses 2 and 3 is saying it was sheer grace that you're where you are today. I chose Abraham. I gave him promises and descendants, and, and you're the end result. And I thought to myself, it's exactly the same with us, actually, here today. The only explanation for me being here, standing in front of you, with a Bible open, is grace. The only reason you're sitting there and you've worshipped God is grace. There was a point in time where God saw you, and there wasn't anything good that he saw in you. But he said, I want you. And he called you from where you were, out of your lifestyle that was going nowhere, and said, come and follow me, and I'll make something out of your life. And we're here. The temptation when we leave here today and get in our fancy cars and go to our big homes and drive over the overpass and see this wonderful church is to think that we've done something great. But we haven't. It's all a gift. It's in one word, grace. In two words, amazing grace. Listen to Ephesians chapter 2 because it, it says it in the New Testament as well. So it's, it's worth reading it in Ephesians chapter 2. This is how Paul puts it. A little different than Joshua, but the same point. Paul says to his Christians, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air the spirit who's now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following our desires and thoughts. Now think about this. He's looking at these Christians that are worshiping God with all of their heart. And he says, remember where you came from. You were dead, stone cold dead in transgressions and sins. That means you had no way on your own to ever connect with the living God. Your spirit was dead. And in fact, he says, your lifestyle was characterized by gratifying the cravings of your flesh and its desires. That's what you followed. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. We deserve nothing but God's wrath. But because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It's by grace that you've been saved. Isn't that good stuff? Even when you were dead in your sin, God made you alive. It's grace that has saved you, Paul says. Exactly the same thing. Same point's been made here in Joshua. <clears throat> and then, um, as the chapter plays out, chapter 24, the, the, the rest of those 13 verses... What God does is he highlights his protection, his provision, his presence, and his power in their lives. He says, I led you all the way. I sovereignly picked out the place for you. I mean, it's really interesting, actually, to see it. In, in verse, um, well, just, let me just sort of, what time is it here? I got some time. There's, there's some intriguing things here about how God works. Um, he works really slow. You ever found that out about God? Gives you a promise. And then it's like he hasn't given you a promise. And it's really, really slow. You don't get that reading this text. You do when you stop and think about it. Um, but I took your father Abraham and gave him many descendants. You know, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Um, this descendant that he was waiting for, it took a long time. Um, it, it, he promised Abraham that through Sarah would come a descendant that would become a great nation. And I'll bet you, every Friday night, they tried for that descendant. And nothing, 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 for years, to the point where it was over, done. Now we're just into the friendship phase. And no descendant, no promise. 25 years later, something happened one night, and Isaac appears. It's a miracle. And to Isaac, I gave Jacob and Esau. You know how long it took for Isaac and Rebekah to have Jacob and Esau? A long time. You don't get that when you just skim over these verses. There's a mystery to the way God works, isn't there? Sometimes you want to give up in your life. But this review says never give up on God because he has a plan and his timetable is slightly different than mine and yours. Verse 4. Um, I assigned the hill country of Seir to Esau, but Jacob and the family 
went down to Egypt. You say, what? Esau was a bad guy. He got the house on the hill with a view. Jacob gets to go to e Egypt. God's favorite person gets to go to Egypt and become a, a slave with his family for 400 years. What's with that? You ever tried to figure out the way God works? There's a mystery in the way God works. It's hard to figure out. But then he goes on and he says, I, I brought you out to the land of the Amorites and they fought against you. I gave them into your hands. In other words, he protected them. He provided for them. His presence went with them wherever they went. And it's an amazing review of their history. That's why I said to you last week that in preparation for the table of the Lord today, one of the best things we could do is review our history with God. Psalm 103. We could slow down and remember where we've come from and where we've been in God's amazing grace. And we would come humbly then to this table and the full impact of the word now in verse 14 would hit us. In verse 14, which is the start of part two, where he says now, what's happening here is he's giving us this signal that he's going to work out the logical implications of everything that God has done for them. Now, fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. And uh, the key, of course, is that word choose in verse 15. If serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served or uh, other gods. But as for me and my household, our choice is we will serve the Lord. The English word choose, we read it and, it, and it sort of looks to the future, but the Hebrew word is packed with a lot more substance. And it, the word choose there looks backward and it looks forward. It really means, I have chosen, and I will continue to choose the Lord. And tomorrow, I will continue to choose the Lord. It's this idea of continuous choice, continuous action. Joshua literally says, I have chosen, and I will continue to choose with my household, the way of the Lord. It, it's the key, actually, to lifelong discipleship. To remember that you chose to say Jesus is Lord. And to say today Jesus is Lord. And when you're tempted tomorrow to say something else is Lord, to say, no, I choose on Monday with none of the people around me and no great worship. I choose the Lord. I, I chose and I choose and I will choose the Lord. That's the key to lifelong discipleship. That was the character of Joshua. He chose, and he chose, and he chose, and he kept right on making wise choices. At the heart of discipleship is this ability to make these wise choices, to renounce other gods, to choose the living God, to choose today and to choose tomorrow, and to keep on choosing the Lord by turning your back on the no gods. Well, what does it mean to choose the Lord? He spells it out here twice. Um, it means to throw away other gods. That's one thing, he says. Uh, that's verse 14. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped. He says it again in verse 23. Throw away the foreign gods and yield your hearts to the Lord. To choose the Lord is to throw away other non-gods and to give your heart to the living God. That's to choose. Now here's the first of two great surprises in this chapter. Did you pick it up? How could it be that after all these years of walking with God and seeing his victories and seeing disaster hit when Achan made a bad choice, how could it be that here you have other gods in the camp? Why, why do you think you would have to say, throw away these false gods. You would think there would be no other gods there. It was God that had brought them this far. It's a God that, but, but they, they worshiped God, but they, they had other gods too. I find that incredible, don't you? That all these years later, having seen a river split, the walls of Jericho fall, the chaos from Achan, the sun standing still. I mean, you, you, on and on it goes. Here we are. Joshua's about to leave. 
And we've still got other gods in the camp that need to be thrown away. I found that incredible when I read this text. But then it stopped me in my tracks because I thought that's no different than today. How could it be that Jesus' followers who made a choice to say Jesus is Lord so long ago can gather together in a room like this and have other gods with us. But it happens all the time. We, um, we say Jesus is Lord, and we clap and we raise our hands and we do warm and fuzzy things. And then we leave the building and we pursue money in which we put our trust and success, making a name for myself, sex, Pornography on our phones and computers and on and on it goes. Pleasure. Other gods that are no gods. And yet we worship the living God. I don't think things have changed a whole lot since Joshua's day. This chapter strikes me as being incredibly relevant, doesn't it to you? Uh, so I, I think the advice and counsel he gives, I, I don't understand how, like, what, 5,000 years later? This chapter still fits, but it does. I think we need to do what Joshua said. I think we need to throw out some of these things. And I think the question that I raised for myself before I brought it to you is what do I need to do to throw away, to end finally and fully my pursuit of other gods? What are my other gods? What am I pursuing to satisfy my desires? Or what am I putting my trust in or trying to build my life on? At the end of the day, what is it that I think about most? And when I figured that out, what do I need to do to throw that away, to end it finally, fully, to make the right choice? It's, it's interesting because there's an urgency to this whole matter because it, it's today. It's not tomorrow. It's not, go home and think about this, guys. It's in, in verse 15. It's um, choose this day who you're going to serve. I mean, if you're hearing the words, and it, uh, Joshua would be saying, and if you're, you're feeling the conviction of the Holy Spirit, then this is the time. You don't go home and you don't think about this stuff. You, if you get it, you, you make the choice because our choices have eternal consequences. And um, you got to got to make the choice, Joshua says, who you're going to serve. He says, I've just reviewed your history with you. You understand what the living God is like, don't you? God of amazing grace. His protection, his provision, his presence has been with you. He actually wants to stay with you. That's the most amazing thing. They could still make the right choice, even though they had other gods with them. He was still there saying, I still want you. What do you want? That was his question. It's amazing, this little sermon that Joshua gives. He says, then yield your hearts to the Lord. Throw them away and give your heart back to God. And then you have the second great surprise in the chapter. The people all flood the altar. He gives the altar call and everybody comes forward and Joshua's ticked off. What's with that? You would think that when he gave that talk and the people say, far from it, Far be it from us to forsake the Lord. We'll serve the Lord. You would think he would say, yes, get these statistics down. And this, you'd think this was the greatest day in the history of the nation, but Joshua didn't think it was, apparently. You ever pondered that? You ever wondered what this is all about, what's going on here? Why was it when the people responded positively, Joshua responded negatively by saying, you're not able to serve the Lord? He's a holy and jealous God. And what hope, really, does that hold out for me and for you? If they weren't able to, then how will I be able to? I, it seems to me, and I, I don't know if this is right, but I think it is. You, can, you, you take it home and check it out. But, but it seems to me there's two things going on here, two problems. One is, they're making the decision lightly. They don't recognize the seriousness of the choice. They, um... They think, oh yeah, we'll choose the Lord. And then it hasn't somehow got down into their DNA, their roots. 
Similar to what you hear Jesus saying when he says, nobody can be my disciple who doesn't first count the cost. Just don't sign up without counting the cost. He says, you know, if a builder's going to build a place or a church is going to add on to the building, don't they first sit down and figure out what the cost will be? He says, that's, that's the same with my disciples. They, they count the cost and they make the decision. I think these people were making it rather lightly. The other issue, I think is that they failed to recognize the character, the unique character of the God they were choosing to serve compared to the gods they had been serving. That's, I think, why Joshua says to them, he's a holy God, he's a jealous God. That's the first time in this book you read about the character of God being framed this way as holy and jealous. And it's worth stopping on for a minute because he's actually the same. I, the Lord, do not change, he says. Holy, that means he's one of a kind. He's unlike no other. He's the one and only. There, the, Hannah, in 1 Samuel 2, says, There's no one like the Lord. There is no one besides you. So if you choose the Lord, you won't be able to choose him the way you've chosen other gods or treated other gods because he's the one and only. He's unique. He's holy. And he's jealous. Let me tell you what that means. He's very, very passionate. And he feels very, very strongly and deeply, unlike you and me. We can be tempted to sin. We can play with it in our heads. And then we can say, oh well, and we'll go and do it and he'll forgive us. That rips his heart out. He feels strongly and he feels deeply. He's passionate. When it says he's jealous, it's another way of God saying, I want all of your heart, and you'll have nothing less than all of my love. I want all of your heart, and you'll get all of my heart, my love. It's a, an exclusive loyalty here. He's, he's a jealous God. So I think Joshua is saying, you better not treat this decision lightly. Know what you're doing. Know what you're getting into. This is the God that you're committing to. He doesn't take easily to sideways glances to other gods. So he feels very, very strongly. That, I think, is what is going on here. And then you have, in verse 26, something we've seen before in the book. Um, Joshua recorded these sayings. They said, doesn't matter, we're in. He said, okay, you're in. And so he wrote this stuff down in a book. I, just let me take an aside there for a minute. Um, our faith um, rests on the written word of God, not just on our feelings or on what you think or saw, but actually on what's been written down in the book of the Lord. That's why Joshua wrote this down, so that they would have it in black and white, they could go back to it, know what God was like, and then rearrange their lives accordingly. If God had just given you feelings in your heart about what was right or wrong, or put writing on the wall and then made it disappear, you would always wonder if you really saw it or just had too much coffee. When it's written down, you can go back and say, this is the character of God. I can always trust that. I can shape my life accordingly. And then he, then he placed this large stone, and he set it up there under the oak near the holy place of the Lord. We've seen something like this in Joshua before. They came through the river, and they made a pile of rocks. It's a... The rocks were a reminder of their choice. This day, you've said you'll serve the Lord. This rock will serve as a reminder so that every time you see it, you'll say, I remember what we chose, and I keep choosing what I chose that first day. So, I mean, you know where this chapter's going, don't you? I mean, it, it, it says to you, so where are you? Um, you're God's people. He's brought us this far by his grace. If you have other gods, God with amazing grace is saying, now throw them away. Get rid of them. Let's end it. And give me your heart. And I think it would be right to add what Joel says. God would then say, and I'm willing to repay you for all the years that you pursued other gods and come up with nothing. Your choice. My choice. What has he given us 
as a reminder of this day and the choice that we might make. Not a big stone, but a table that's set in front of you. This actually set up here in the platform too. A table. A table with bread and a cup. A table that you come to and you remember the day you said, I choose Jesus as my God, my Lord. A table that you can come to even when you need to throw away other gods and find that his arms are still open to receive you. You come to this table, though, and he says, I want 100% of your heart, and I'll give you 100% of my love. But you can't negotiate with him outside of that. It's 100% and 100%. You give him 100%, he gives you 100% of his love. We're going to walk up to the table today, and, and you actually don't have to. I'm okay with that. We're all okay with that. I really don't want you to do this unthinkingly. I want you to do it in the light of what God is talking to me about and you about through this chapter. I want you to walk up and remember the choice you made, but I only want you to walk up and remember that choice if you're saying today, and I still choose Jesus as Lord. And I'm prepared to end finally in any way God tells me my relationship with no gods, ungods. And get the optics of this today. Get the visual. When you're walking up to the table, it's a table that Jesus hosts. Not me. He's here. In the person of his spirit. He gives you the bread. He gives you that. You are, to the optics are, you are walking to him, facing him. And you are turning your back on all the non-gods that you played around with. So you can come to the table and receive grace and mercy, but you face them, but you're putting behind you all the other gods that you're prepared to never take up again. In the words of the marriage covenant, and forsaking all others, I take you, Lord Jesus, today. Does that work for you? Does that make sense? Let's, um, let's take a moment just to to think. And I'd like to pray and give thanks for the bread on the table and the cup and for Jesus' presence here. As I pray, the people will come up that are going to serve us. And then when you're ready, if you'd like to, I welcome you in the name of Jesus to come and take bread and take the cup. Let's just take a moment to think. Father, we come to you today in Jesus' name and sometimes we forget who we come to. We're so grateful that we can call you Father and yet we remember that your character is that of a holy father and a jealous father. But we really don't want it any other way. We don't want you to be like all the gods that we've pursued in worship because they haven't satisfied us. They haven't been big enough to build our lives on. We don't want you to not care about where we go and what we do. We're thankful that you're passionately jealous for our hearts. And Lord, as we come to you at this table, we thank you that you gave us this rock, this table, to remember that you paid for our sins fully on the cross, that you left heaven in order to do this. And you sent the Holy Spirit to wake us up from our deadness of spirit, to pursue something greater and better than we'd ever imagined before. 
Father, as we come to you today in Jesus' name, I ask that you would forgive us for the many times we've wandered away and our foolish hearts that have gone back to the things that you set us free from. And we want to declare today that our hope and our confidence, Father, in coming to you is represented on this table by the bread and the cup for which we thank you. The body and blood of Jesus, that's our hope. And Father, as we come today, we remember that you raised Jesus from the dead. And as host of this table, we receive the bread and the cup from his hands. I pray that you would meet us here in Jesus' name. Amen.